Okay, um, in this third video on um, the week four content on class and inequality, I'm going to introduce the work of uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Um, Bourdieu is the uh, sociologist, sociologist that most influences my own research. Um, I use his ideas a lot in the writing and the analysis that I do, and um, I think his work is still very vital for understanding how class is kind of practiced today, how it's and how class is becomes part of who we are from really early age. You know, we're socialised into our class from the moment we're born. So you can see um, in, in Bourdieu's work that he fuses together aspects of Marx and Weber and also a whole lot of other um, sociologies, sociologists and philosophers. Um, you'll, you know, you'll probably notice aspects even of the likes of Goffman. Um, so what Bourdieu's project wants us to think about is how class is reproduced intergenerationally and through institutions. So um, he is both taking on those economic kind of inequalities and aspects of class that Marx was the original kind of theoriser of, and also bringing in together kind of the cultural aspects that Weber talks about in terms of aspects of status and the kind of everyday symbolic interactions that are useful for thinking about how class is made in kind of everyday situations, and I'll go through some examples of that in a second. A key concept that Bourdieu develops to do this is the concept of habitus. Um, for Bourdieu, this is a way of kind of breaking that agency and structure divide, and, uh, and he kind of sketches it as a way of thinking about how those two things really are always co-constituted with the other. Um, those things are kind of, it's such a kind of constant dialogue, I suppose, that it's almost pointless thinking about them as two separate things. Structures and agency both become part of who we are as individuals and um, how we participate in groups. So what the habitus is, is essentially like a socially learned disposition, the way that we're kind of socialised in the world through some of, you can kind of relate this to some of the socialisation theories we looked at in weeks, weeks one, and how we come to be the kind of person who we are in the sense of you know, how we feel comfortable in some situations rather than others, uh, the different knowledges and skills we develop, the different affinities we have, uh, largely based from the kind of famil uh, family um, socialisation processes. So I'm going to talk about cultural capital for, um, in a minute, but like an example of this kind of familiarity that habitus is a way of thinking about is that there's been a whole lot of studies, for instance, that show that if houses with lots of books, there's almost a graph, graph, more books in a household tend to lead to kind of better um, educational outcomes. In terms of a Borgesian analysis of this, um, just having books in the household allows the kind of child to have an affinity with books, they become more normal, they are, I suppose, more likely to read, and this can kind of then lead to educational advantages when they move into, um, into school. Um, those with less books in the house, when they come to school, haven't had as much familiarity with that item that's, you know, so important for learning. So habitus in this way becomes what Bourdieu calls a feel for the game. It's this kind of way of being and seeing and feeling in the world that we all carry around with us. And it kind of works as a kind of mechanism that um, as we come into contact with other people, with things or go into specific institutions, it sparks in us a way of kind of performing ourselves, almost in that Goffman-esque kind of way. Um, you know, as I was talking about, we are talking about Goffman, we tend to kind of somewhat behave differently when, you know, maybe we're in front of our parents and friends. For Bourdieu, kind of the habitus is the thing that kind of drives these different ways of being in these different social circumstances. But importantly, what Bourdieu brings to this analysis is how those performances are always inherently unequal, depending on the context and depending on who gets to define what's normal, what's legitimate and what is knowledge and, and things like that in that specific situation. So how does class play a role in this? Well, in a number of different ways. Bourdieu sketches out economic capital, cultural capital, and social capital. I'll just touch upon the cultural and economic here. So in Marx, uh, Marx's work on capitalism, the way that you know um, profit is made is that you know the ruling class tend to have capital, that is, um, you know, money and property and assets to be able to invest, and capital leads to more capital. You know, the kind of, you've all heard the cliches about you know kind of need money to make money. Bourdieu kind of takes that kind of idea of economic capital, which is, you know, in still 
in Bordeaux really important in terms of how inequality works, and uses it kind of metaphorically to talk about what he calls cultural capital. And what Bourdieu means by cultural capital is that people from different backgrounds tend to have different affinities, um, different things that they like, um, different skills, different capacities, and it's these things that the people take out into the world, into different parts of society, and invest. And when and the amount of cultural capital that one has affects the life chances in that sense, affects how much, I suppose, the probability or the ability of being successful in a particular practice. And I'll go through some examples of that in a minute. So cultural capital means a number of different things. It can be some things you own. So where in Bourdieu, he kind of, in his kind of research, made distinctions between high and low capital. So people with lots of cultural capital in his work, you know, had paintings and and went to the opera and stuff like that. That's a little bit more dated today as kind of, you know, high and low culture has become more blurred. I think when it comes to kind of the actual things people own, we can kind of think about things like books, but things like, you know, the latest technology, the latest computers, the latest kind of operating systems uh, can be kind of be seen as those objectified forms of capital. But more importantly, Bourdieu, I think, talks about what he calls embodied cultural capital. And this relates somewhat to the kind of habitus stuff that I was talking about, but those kind of internal capacities and skills and acquaintances and affinities that we have with various um, objects and various practices and various institutions. So I'll give you some specific examples to understand this a little bit better in a second. The third really kind of important um, concept um, from Bourdieu is the idea of field. And fields are kind of, you know, methodological, um, uh, it's a kind of methodological tool for sociologists to do research with. Um, and what it does is kind of highlights how individuals and groups don't really take part in all of society at once. It's kind of impossible. We kind of take part in specific um, practices in kind of specific, what he calls fields. Um, and these fields can be things like the education system, um, the, the labour market, the field of consumption where we kind of, you know, some of us might be vegans and some of us eat meat, so there's different practices in that field of consumption, or if you want to broaden the idea of consumption out further, some of us have, you know, um, taste in opera and some of us like heavy metal. So we practice in that field of consumption by struggling over those things. Um, you know, and there's kind of more broader fields like the media, the politics, economics, these kinds of things. So what Bourdieu shows is these fields are where people um, are kind of compelled or impelled, um, largely coming from um, their habitus in the sense that some people are more likely to be attracted to some fields than others, but there's many fields that we're also forced to participate in, like education, for instance. Um, inside these fields is kind of where knowledge and kind of normality is kind of produced in many ways. So, you know, the field of politics has the kind of control over, you know, controlling funding and, you know, controlling much of the way that things are spoken about in public. The field of science, you know, comes up with our kind of versions of truth and knowledge and all that kind of stuff that we'll um, look at critically later in the course. The field of media largely controls how things are represented. Um, the field of education um, teaches us, you know, what's legitimate knowledge, teaches us to turn up on time, teaches us maths and all those kind of things that become skills to take out into those fields. And the kind of, um, I suppose, opportunity for success in those fields for Bourdieu does relate to economic capital. If you have more money, you're likely to be able to kind of pay for the things and have access to things that give you advantage in those particular fields, but also are really dependent on the deployment of cultural capital. So the examples of this is kind of, kind of mentioned already in education systems, you know, more books in the households seem to lead to more educational success, but also in terms of cultural capital, if your parents are you know, highly educated, they're more likely to be able to um, deploy an affinity for their child in the, in the way that they interact with their child in terms of the you know, confidence of you know, being able to help with homework, um, knowing about the topics and all that kind of thing. So these kind of affinities, therefore, are instilled through that kind of um, family relationship. Um, if you think about the art world, for instance, you need to kind of know about the kind of history of, I don't know, impressionistic pa pa paintings or the, you know, the difference between Dadaism and Surrealism. If you want to go into a museum and know legitimately 
understand the art rather than just maybe enjoying it for its, 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 for its aesthetic purposes. Um, so it's these kind of innate knowledge, skills, capacities that people develop in their socialization um, that allows people to kind of have access to these spaces and to be more successful in them. But importantly, um, these spaces are also kind of exclusionary in that the people without those capitals will have more struggle, will have to work harder, and are often just excluded from those spaces whatsoever. Um, so this reinforces the class system because what this means is those with already high levels of cultural capital are the ones that get to control what is knowledge, what is truth, what is cool in these particular fields. Um, and therefore, what this means is that those with lots of cultural capital tend to be able to make the world in their own image and in their own interests, um, even if they're not necessarily meaning to do this. They might be just kind of, you know, practicing their own day to day life. But this means that people without that cultural capital are kind of forced to learn to be someone else. Again, the school student coming into the education system that doesn't have, like, you know, parents that are highly educated, that hasn't had a lot of um, experience of the schooling system that hasn't got a lot of familiarity with reading is going to have to come to school and almost learn to be a different kind of person. They have to kind of, you know, learn all this new stuff that's like much more easier for the kind of maybe more middle class child that's already had a strong affinity with those kind of things. So in terms of how we can kind of think about this, these, these diagrams are quite common in Bourdieu and Bourdieusian research. I will say they're, they can be a little bit kind of confusing and I think a little bit of a distortion. When you look at something like this, you've got to remember that's a snapshot of a particular time and really, you know, plotting out food on a, a thing like this might be different, you know, in a couple of months' time. It also would be very different between countries or whatever. But it's a way of thinking about how different everyday practices that we might take for granted and these in many ways, these maps in many ways are a kind of effort to make the normal look strange. Um, we kind of take them from granted, but they're embedded um, with class relations. So here you can see a bunch of food, um, you know, they argue that, you know, more, more economic capital and less cultural capital will be on one quadrant, um, and you can kind of see through that. Now, importantly here again, these things will change over time. Um, and what these um, maps often show is the way that things change over time. I mean... Um, the example I use about this is like, you know, 15 years ago, it would have been almost impossible to cons to see like a working class guy in high beers eating sushi like for lunch, but like this has become more normal. So um, things will move around this map when you look over time and that's how kind of a good representation of how social change happens. So one of the key uh, things, things I want you to take out of this um, kind of very brief introduction on Bourdieu, I think relates back to, I think, um, one of the more... Um, well-known quotes from Bourdieu, which is taste classifies and it classifies the classifier. You know, that's typical kind of social theory doublespeak there in a way, but like if you break it down, it's, it's quite a simple thing to consider. Um, what Bourdieu is arguing in these kind of ways, the cultural capital becomes a mechanism of being able to kind of have success in a particular uh, field or have more influence in the way the society works, is that what that means is those kind of people with lots of cap cultural capital have particular tastes, um, and so they classify things as being, I don't know, cool, being legitimate, being true, being legal, um, all these kind of different things that happen in these different fields. So um, it, that classifies, but the way that the people classify also classifies them. So the simple example that I try and use to do this is the kind of hipster bogan thing that I've talked about in course already. Um, when you call someone a hipster, you're classifying them and you're using all kinds of class markers there tend to be kind of middle class kind of consumption practices you know around coffee and beards and all that kind of thing so when you call someone hipster you're classifying you're classifying their taste taste classifiers but when you make that classification you are also classified by doing that because one person's hipster might be another person's bogan and i say that because i've been called both of those things so the classification you make also, in a way, classifies you. We can think this more simply, I suppose, in terms of music taste. Um, if someone comes up to you and tells you that they like heavy metal or that they like, you know, One Direction or they like, I don't know, Billie Eilish or um, they like Elton John or whatever, 
you'll tend to kind of, in your head, have an idea of what that music person is, whether you like them or not, you know, and then you'll have these associations with what, say, a heavy metal fan is, and you'll classify them. But that classification classifies you, largely based, I suppose, whether you like heavy metal or not. If you like heavy metal, um, you're more likely to kind of associate with that person. If you're not liking heavy metal, you're more likely to kind of have some kind of social distance or maybe not feel like you have as much in common. So in that sense, taste classifiers and it classifies the classifier is a way of thinking about how people relate to each other, often through class relations, but not really recognises class relations, more recognises kind of taste relations. And we can do this kind of analysis too when we think about morals, think about values, think about ethics. Um, people's values are very different, so when you kind of judge someone, say, on their parenting practices or their dietary habits or the way that they dress, all these kind of things will be done through that kind of hierarchical system based on relations of cultural capital, but will also therefore situate you in that kind of field as well. Importantly here, a really key concept to consider of what happens in these relations of classification is what Bourdieu calls symbolic violence. For Bourdieu, those with less economic capital, less cultural capital, tend to be the ones that experience symbolic violence the most. And what Bourdieu argues is they almost participate in this because of the kind of way that people accept what's normal and what those kind of power relations are. Um, this happens through kind of that kind of misrecognition that like these hierarchies are somehow legitimate, but really from the Borgesian perspective, these hierarchies are really kind of very much socially constructed. And that's a quite challenging idea because, um, you know, a literature professor that gets to say that Shakespeare is, you know, the most kind of high quality literature or whatever, from the Borgesian perspective, that's actually more a representation or relates more to that professor's power than the actual quality of the work itself. If the experts decide all of a sudden that, um, I don't know, Stephen King or, you know, whatever is kind of the high point of literature, that would become, you know, what's studied. Um, the actual object itself and the quality of it isn't what's important in terms of it being rated highly or not. It's actually the power and the taste of the people that make get to make those categorize, categorizations. So for the, those that don't get to make the categorizations, they experience what's called symbolic violence. So the kid coming into school that I've been kind of using as an example would experience symbolic violence because all of a sudden there's a demand for them to be someone else, to do all these new practices that they may not have a strong affinity with. Common everyday examples is like any time you go into a place where you might feel a little bit less comfort um, and you can kind of feel this in your emotions, your skin crawls and your sweat and things like that. Um, examples, you know, going to people sometimes don't want to go to museums because they don't, you know, understand the, the history or the, or the lingo required. Um, if you go to a fancy dinner and you don't know the, the knives and forks and what they're all used for, you can experience that kind of discomfort. It's those kind of everyday discomforts that come from class relations of not knowing what to do, of not having the cultural capital, are experiences these forms of symbolic violence. Important politics and the media are key disseminators of symbolic violence. So things, um, and the use of language in particular, is a key way that symbolic violence is disseminated. And this is done a lot um, in everyday ways that we don't think of. A really obvious one is the way that the term ethnic is used in politics and media in particular. Ethnicity is meant to just describe to different groups, you know, so, you know, white Anglo people in Australia are actually an ethnic group, but it's never used like that in politics or media. It's always used to um, describe a minority. And this in and of itself is a form of symbolic violence because it discriminates and marginalises some groups over others. It inserts a power relation into that term that shouldn't really be there. You can see this in others like doll bludgers and boat people, the way that kind of labels are used in particular are key forms of symbolic violence. Later in the course, we'll look in globalization, at globalisation and the labels of like developing and developed world, first and third world, the way that we describe different parts of the world are uh, inherently have these power relations in it, which, you know, we can criticise from all kinds of different ways. So symbolic violence in that sense is one of the key class relations. Those with more cultural capital tend to experience it much less. There are situations where they do experience it, but those with less cultural capital experience this symbolic violence based on relations of, um, on, on these kind of power relations. 
Um, and for Bourdieu, this is the way that class reproduces itself in everyday situations, in that kind of symbolic interactionist tradition that we've looked at earlier in the course. Okay, I'll leave it there and um, do um, in the next video just some brief um, comments on class today in Australian society.